Welcome back to Go and Preach. Last time we were together, we talked about three feasts uh, that the children of Israel were required to attend in Jerusalem. They were the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now today I want to talk a little bit about the Feast of Tabernacles because it's very important prophetically as we head into the last days. Now, uh, in the natural, it's very it's a it's a common thread throughout interpreting scripture that things that happen in the natural Israel they have a spiritual interpretation in the church and especially the church of the last days. And nowhere is this more true than in the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles took place towards the end of the year of the Israeli calendar, the Jewish calendar. It happened at the end of the year agriculturally because it was also known as the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Ingathering because it was celebrated at the end of the year when the crops were gathered into the barns. Historically, the Feast of Tabernacles took place annually after the latter rain had fallen and brought those crops to full maturity. Now, this is important because the Feast of Tabernacles will have many facets of spiritual interpretation. Spiritually speaking, the latter rain speaks of an end time revival and outpouring of the Holy Spirit that has to take place in order to bring the church to maturity and bring in a huge harvest of souls. Now in James chapter 5 verse 7 the apostle James said be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the Lord behold the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for until he receive the early and the latter rain. Now here he's telling us that we must have an early rain and a latter rain before the, before the Lord can come and receive or harvest a mature church. This is important. Remember, there were three feasts, and those three feasts have a historical fulfillment in the, in the land of Israel and in the church. Now let's think back when the Feast of Pentecost had a fulfillment. And it's interesting because it had a fulfillment in natural Israel and it coincided with an interpretation in the church. That happened on the day of Pentecost when 120 disciples were in the upper room and on Mount Zion where they were seeking the Lord and suddenly they were empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to the nations. That happened both in natural Israel, amen, but it also was the birth of the church. And on that day, there was a great harvest of souls. And those men and women that were in the upper room, they went out to all the world and turned the world upside down and brought many, many into the kingdom of God. Now, spiritually speaking, that was the early rain that James talked about. The Father is waiting to receive the early rain and the latter rain. Now, in the natural. Remember, the natural is going to reveal the spiritual to us over and over again throughout Scripture. You'll find this to be true. Now, in the natural, the latter rain was at the, at the end of the year. The early rain was near the beginning of the year that softened the ground for the planting of, this, of the crops, of the seeds, and there was a small harvest. The barley harvest took place at that time, but then the grapes and all those things were planted at the early rain. But then the latter rain comes much later in the year after a long, dry season. And the latter rain, when it falls at the end of the year, just before the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month, naturally, it was seven or eight times greater volume of rain that fell during the latter rain compared to the early rain. Now, again, since all of these natural things have spiritual significance, we should expect that this last day revival that's coming will be much greater in magnitude than what they had at the 
Pentecost. And if those 120 on Mount Zion went around and changed the world, just imagine what can take place in this last hour, the 11th hour before the return of Christ. Now, it's very interesting. Each time the Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated in Scripture, it points to something, a spiritual truth, that we can expect in the great move of the Spirit that is coming. Now, one particular occasion where they were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles happens uh, at the dedication of Solomon's temple. During that feast in the seventh month, this is found in 1 Kings chapter 8, and verse 2, when Solomon's temple was being dedicated, the Lord came and he moved in such a powerful way. The Bible tells us that they were singing and they were worshiping the Lord and they all fell down on their faces. They were slain in the spirit. And there was a, a cloud, a visible glory cloud of Almighty God that filled that temple. You can also see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 14. There was a manifest uh, manifest presence of his power and of his glory. Thus, we can say that this Feast of Tabernacles is associated with God's visible glory. Amen. Now, something that's not readily seen by the casual reader of Scripture is that leading up to that dedication of the temple, there were years and years of preparation that preceded that dedication. Before the temple was filled with glory, there was a lot of work that went into it. And you actually have to back up. You have to back up. Before Solomon, there was a king by the name of David who was called a man after God's own heart. And under his direction, if you recall, he organized worship teams to play and to worship the Lord 24 hours a day. He set up a temple, or a, sorry, a tabernacle, a tent, on top of a mountain that is known as Mount Zion. And here they brought the Ark of the Covenant. And for 40 years before, you know, during the age of the law, when it was completely illegal against the law for anybody to come in the presence of the ark for 40 years, it's as though God said this is a special time and anybody could come into the presence of Almighty God. They practiced, they worshiped, they sensed his power, they sensed his glory, and they saw the cloud even in that tent. And for many years, those were people who were trained on Mount Zion. They were sanctified, they were trained, and they put everything in order. And they were the ones that God used. Then when the ark was moved down into the temple of Solomon 40 years later, 47 years later, and the teams that had been practicing and practicing, they came down to the temple as well. And they brought in, they ushered in a new era in the children in the land of Israel, they ushered in a new time. They ushered in the glory and the presence of God into the temple of Solomon. And now again, you see this again in the early church. I mentioned this a, a couple sessions ago. That it was the disciples, the 120 that, that tarried in the upper room on Mount Zion. They allowed God to prepare their hearts. They had to put some things in order. They, they replaced Judas, the betrayer. They got a new uh, Matthias who replaced him. And they, they sat there and they, they leader, leadership was put in position. Peter stepped into his place as the natural leader of the group. Here for 10 days as they waited. They prepared themselves, their hearts, in the upper room for 10 days. And then, as we've already said in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit came on Mount Zion, and those men and women went out and changed the world. They changed the entire history of the world. Even to this day, we are feeling the effects of what those 120 people did in that room. Amen. So where am I going with this? Their main work was to go and to preach the gospel. That is the work of evangelism. 
the of evangelizing the lost. Now it's true that there's going to be teaching that is necessary, but evangelism is going to be necessary to bring in converts before we can teach them. Amen. And in the same way, I believe it is those who have come to spiritual Mount Zion that God will use to bring his glory and coming revival to the nations. They will be filled with the glory of God from Mount Zion, and they will bring the glory out to the earth. Firstly, by spreading the gospel and winning souls, and then, of course, discipling them and teaching them and bringing them to maturity in Christ so that we won't come empty-handed before the Lord when it comes to the Feast of Tabernacles either. Amen? So Feast of Tabernacles is a very important feast prophetically because it speaks to the end time in gathering, the end time harvest of souls. It speaks of the glory of God and it speaks of revival and it speaks of coming to maturity in Christ. And all of those things also require the work of evangelism to go forth. So I want to encourage you with that. And I hope that God is stirring a vision in your heart for all of these things. And next time we'll come back and we'll talk about the Dead Sea. God bless you. See you next time.